Hi, Nick. Hi. How are you? Fine, thank you very much. Yeah. How, how is life these days? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm enjoying myself. Yep. Good. So yep. for, the, um, for the people that, or the few people in Bristol that do not know you, can you give a quick presentation about you and who you are? Okay, so um, I'm Nick. Uh, I am uh, in perhaps my kind of third, my fourth phase of career. Um, so I trained as an engineer, electronics computing uh, engineer. I got a first uh, from Swansea University, but I never really understood electronics. Um, uh, I thought I wanted to work in medical electronics for a while, worked in a couple of startups, then worked for Inmos Semiconductor Company, which was part of a multinational, French, Italian multinational uh, in Bristol. Uh, grew for us made redundant in 93 and took the opportunity to start our own business. So six of us uh, co-founded a business called Motion Media, making video phones, we grew that, listed it on the stock exchange, uh, bought a US company, and then merged with an Austrian company. So I've kind of been through the roller coaster of um, growth and, and decline. So we kind of had to downsize a few times, but a fascinating journey. Um, made a bit of money out of that, but not a huge amount. Um, I was the last of the founders to leave uh, and came out of that, realized my network was nowhere near what I thought it would be. Um, I actually didn't know many people outside of the bubble that I'd been in for the previous 10 years or so. Uh, so I started to network like crazy, joined the IOD, got quite involved with the Institute of Directors, uh, and then stumbled across this project called Set Squared, an incubator run by the university. So this was 2005, the incubator was two or three years old. So I joined that as a mentor, volunteer mentor, then became entrepreneur in residence uh, on a contract, three month contract. Uh, and then 2006, no, yeah, 2006, I took over running the center um, and grew that. And then 2013, I, because we needed a new home for the Set Squid Incubator, uh, we were on the university precinct um, and created Engine Shed uh, 2013 and moved Set Squared in here and created um, the Engine Shed project, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, and then the back end of 2019, I decided my time was time for me to move on. So now I'm working freelance. Good. So, well, I guess a lot of people will know you in Bristol because of the Engine Shed and like the work that you've done by creating this space that we're in today. But if we if we take a step back and i guess that's when i think that's when we got to know each other is when when you were in set squared effectively so can you present a little bit about set squared because that's still a very much an incubator that exists in strive and growth in, in bristol so can you present set squared a bit and then what is set squared's aim to do yeah so so set squared is an incubator for uh high tech high growth uh businesses uh so the model with Set Squared, it's it's not like most other incubators, nor like most accelerators. It's kind of a hybrid. So the model with with Set Squared um, and Set Squared itself is a partnership between five universities: Bristol, Bath, Exeter, Southampton, Surrey. But the Set Squared incubator model is, whilst hosted by the university, the brief is to support companies that come from anywhere. So they might come from the university student base or research base, but actually most companies come from the community, if you like. So the model is we set square takes in companies that are typically quite early stage. They're tech based with an aspiration for growth. And set square's role is to help fulfill the potential of those uh, companies uh, through coaching, mentoring, workshops, access to professional services, investor readiness training, investor showcase events, uh, business review panels, mock boards, and base and space if they need it. Um, basically, any, anything that the incubator team can do using its network, its knowledge, uh, its leverage to help that, cost, that company to achieve its potential, that, that's, that's the brief. And what, what's quite interesting, we, the, the incubator doesn't invest in companies, yeah. it doesn't take a stake. And one bit of the special source then is that it can be a real, true, honest broker for the company and do everything purely in the interest of the, of, of the company. So, and it becomes a bit like parenting. 
uh, in that you kind of sometimes you need to give some hard truths. Uh, sometimes you need to really push home a, a, a point to kind of an entrepreneur. Um, but because we build up trust or the incubator team build up trust with the entrepreneur, it allows you to then actually deliver those truths. Like, for example, to a founding CEO, perhaps you're not the right person to take this business forward. And that's a really difficult conversation. But because the incubator is an honor, you know, they, they, they don't have a financial stake in the business, they can be honest. And because they built up the trust, it's, it's trusted advice. And that's quite powerful and allows um, the incubator to develop a long-term relationship which is overtly in the interests of the company and, and then works to, 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 to the benefits of the, of the company, whatever path they take. What that also means is that the incubator is able to take a, a very um, high risk, if you like, or take in high risk businesses because it's not investing, it can take that risk. And so um, even if a company has perhaps a 5% chance of success, which an investor wouldn't touch with a barge pole, Set Squared can take them in yeah. because if they can see a role for uh, helping that company get to the right place, and if that the right place is stopping, coming to a controlled stop in six months, well, fine, that's a positive outcome. And in fact, uh, certainly when I last looked at the figures, about 30% of the companies that Set Squared took in, in Bristol that is, uh, come to a kind of a, a, a safe controlled stop within within 12 months before they start trading or take investment. And that, and that's positive. That's very at, 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 the, at the very least, what you're doing is releasing the, that entrepreneurial talent back into the talent pool. Yeah. Um, uh, because having a business that, that, that goes under doesn't really help anybody. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of failure and stigmatize failure. But if you can avoid it, um, um, you, you should. So, I mean, so working for Set Squared and growing it, when I took over... Running it, we're about 25 companies. Uh, I believe at the moment it's probably now about 65. I stopped running it directly in about 2016 when uh, Monica Radcliffe came in. I hired Monica Radcliffe to um, take over day to day running and strategic direction of the incubator itself. Uh, and th th it's been a, been a great success. And I think it's because we've been able to maintain that honest brokerage. We haven't had to deliver on anybody's metrics. You know, it delivers value for the university by helping to stimulate the economic environment in Bristol, which makes Bristol a thriving place, which helps the university attract students and attract staff and be part of a, a thriving economy. Set Square, the university plays its role in stimulating that through the Set Square incubator, um, rather than specifically short-term outputs for the benefit of the university. However, some of the university's most successful financially as well as profile and, and impactfully uh, spin-outs from the university have come through the Set Squid Incubator, like Exmos, like Ultra Haptics, uh, Microma and, and so on, which have been really good for the, um, the university. But have, and, and Zylo is another great example. You know, the founder of Zylo says that he wouldn't have been, and he's just sold his company for 800 million, up to $800 million, uh, as a spin out from the university, he wouldn't have got there if it hadn't been for Set Squared. So you can see now why the university supports the Set Squared activity, even if it's mostly about supporting companies that haven't had anything to do with the university. So you can see there's an indirection there. It, it does make sense. I mean, yes, the, 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 the aim of the university is to attract the students. The aim for students is to find jobs in cool and uh, upcoming companies. So all that kind of makes sense. But so Set Squared last year, I believe, got named the best incubator in the world. Yep. Um, you were obviously part of that story. Yep. Uh, what did it take to get there? It's not just about it's not just about being truth and honest. Like it certainly had something that make it the best the best incubator in the world. So, so there's a certain amount about scale. So the world ranking, the world ranking which we run it won in 2015 and 18 and tw and 19 uh so we've got it three times was for the partnership the five incubators across the set squared partnership so there's a certain amount of strength in numbers <clears throat> uh 
But I think it does come down to the model of being part of the university, but also supporting companies from outside. Because universities don't, most universities don't produce enough spin-out activity to justify justify a whole incubator. So balancing supporting spin-outs with supporting companies from the community allows you to support more companies, deliver more impact, give you that kind of critical mass that makes you interesting to investors. So we have a lot of investors who come and knock on the door to see set squared companies. And so the companies raise a lot of money. So the metrics for that global ranking were about jobs created, about investment raised, uh, as well as the kind of the quality of the incubation process. Okay. So here we're talking about a timeline that is like, I think you said between 2012, 2013 to 2016, 2017. Is that, no, no, in terms of like the, your set square timeline of you taking over. So I took over in 2006. Oh, 2006. Yeah, 2006 and uh, handed over to Monaco in 2016. Oh, wow. So okay. from 2013 to 2016, I was running both set squared and engine shed, which oh. was a bit much. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so um, hence we needed to recruit somebody else into the fold to do that. <laughs> and so obviously everybody today is talking about the growth of Bristol and, and the south, southwest region like as a whole, but Bristol being the forefront of it. Um, we all know that this is not like an overnight success and it's something that's been up and coming and, and a lot of work has been done on the back of it. And you've probably been on the forefront of it. Now, can you pinpoint about a few elements or can you give an idea of like, why is Bristol today what Bristol is? Like what has made that happen probably like 10 or 12 years ago? Is there any decisions that have happened there? I think it's not so much decisions. To- I mean, I, I think a lot about this and I keep on getting asked, why is Bristol no, why does it have the reputation now for being such a, uh, a vibrant tech economy as well as more broadly than that? And, and when 10 years ago, it, it, it wasn't. <clears throat> so I think a number of things have happened. Um, as an incubator, kind of a couple of approaches that I think we took that have made a big impact. One is... Uh, and it's part of the honest broker bit, but it's just focusing on doing the right thing, helping create great companies. And often they take longer than, than, than you envisage to come to fruition, but focus on creating good quality companies for the sake of creating good quality companies uh, means that you, you're sowing some, some uh, good quality seeds in the ecosystem. And then those have then flourished or morphed into other things. Uh, But if you do a good job at creating sustainable businesses that then attract talent from elsewhere, that talent then stays in the city because Bristol is a very attractive place to live. So startup, you know, starts up, grows, recruits people from from around the the world. Uh, They stay, company folds, because it happens every now and again, and they go and work for another company. But what that does is to fuel, fuel growth and fuel the momentum. Um, The second thing that that we did was, and and I think this is quite important, and I didn't realise why I was doing it at the time, but we've always taken a very generous approach to uh, supporting other things. It would be very easy as an incubator to just do everything that gives us a short-term benefit, only doing stuff for us. I never took that approach. Uh, Perhaps it's because I'm passionate about the city, uh, more generally, but I was always generous with time, supporting activities, sharing what we knew, um, uh, inviting people in to see um, anything we could do to support the ecosystem more generally, quite informally. And that helped create a trusted environment. So really what that means is that now we've got lots of co-working spaces and incubators and so on, and energy is not wasted fighting each other, we share. And yeah. in a growing market, there's enough business to go around. But external events, I think, um, one, th- one thing in 2010 that made a big difference to the city was when the leaders' debates, there was a general election, leaders' debates, the, the, um, the candidates for the general election, uh, Nick Clegg, David Cameron, uh, Gordon Brown, 
had a hustings in the Arnolfini, summer's evening, global media, on Bristol, and it looked great. And that kind of put Bristol on the map, I think. Um, and what it did is created a tipping point of confidence in the city. So I think from that point on, people felt proud. You go somewhere, you're in London or wherever, and say, oh, I'm from Bristol. Oh, Bristol, I'm, I'm, that's, that's interesting. Where it used to be, where? Um, and once you get past that tipping point and you feel proud about talking about Bristol, you talk about all the things that are going on. And there's always been really great stuff going on in the city. But if you start to talk about it and you start to feel proud about it, then people catch that infectiousness, um, if you like, uh, and, and, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there is a, a tipping point of confidence in the city. Now it's a confident city, mostly. Uh, and, and so it, it projects itself well. And, um, and also you've got quality here. Yeah. It's interesting you get, you know, we get investors come down from London and say, oh, I've heard there's lots going on, um, introducing me to all these, all these companies. And you say, oh, well, you know, here's five or six companies. And they kind of look disappointed because there haven't been 200 companies wanting to meet them. <laughs> but when they meet these five or six companies, they're probably all investable. They're all good quality propositions. Whereas what they're used to in London or Manchester is seeing 100 companies and whittling that down to about one or two that are possibly investable. Now, being a bit, a bit of a generalisation, but the point is, Bristol has always been quality over quantity. Uh, and the stats back that up is that as an economy, we've got a lower number of startups per head of population than the other core cities, but the survivability, uh, the failure rate is much better than elsewhere. So my view is that if companies get off the ground, they're more likely to survive but you don't get companies that haven't got any viability getting off the ground in the first place. No. So I think that's a positive environment. It, it leads to good quality employment growth. What, what, one thing that has always, always amazed me with Bristol, and as you know, I've, I've only came to Bristol like now 11 years ago, um, but even from day one, it's this desire to just share in Bristol is everywhere, regardless yeah. if you're like a startup founder, if you're yeah. a a high level director, C level kind of person, or if you're just like a developer designer, whatever, yeah, there's yeah. always people willing to share. There's always events where people are like willing yeah. to share. And I hope this will continue. Yeah. I kind of like see that now being eroded a bit. Like you kind of feel like the, the people practicing the work, the developers, the designers, yeah. they're still there in the meetups. The higher levels, the founders, the C levels, they're sharing a bit less or they're less yeah. mixing, or that's what I okay, found today. Yeah. But that, that leads me to my, my next question, which is obviously now Bristol is growing. Um, Bristol has reached a certain point, which means that it's on the map for all the successes. Yeah. But it's also on the spotlight for like, where, where are the next challenges for Bristol? And there's certainly a few challenges around inclusivity, around, um, around like having access to jobs in certain yeah. parts of Bristol. Yeah. What, where, do you, where do you feel are the next challenges for Bristol as a city and for us as, as companies in Bristol? Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, you've, you've seen, seen this all over the place that um, as, a, as, a, as a cluster grows, be it a city level or smaller than that, it evolves and things change and, and, and nothing can stay, stay the same. So, so um, we've now got a much higher level of uh company activity so more more mid-stage companies if you like some of which that have moved to bristol relocated to bristol others that have grown here like the graph cores and the ultra leaps and and so on um and of course the dynamics change if you've got a what we used to have which was you know a lot of small but growing and ambitious companies the, 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 the CEOs are probably the founders and they've grown with the, with the business. As, that, as the, the economy matures, if you like, and what Bristol is, you know, it's a thousand year old economy, but the tech cluster is kind of maturing. Um, you've, you've perhaps got people who've come in from elsewhere and they're, you know, for want of a better word, the professional CEO 
and they perhaps hadn't got the, the history and they, and they had to be looking more global than, than local. So you've got to have that, that shift of dynamic. I hope we don't lose the collaborative culture and I don't think you know what I've just described needs to exclude a collaborative culture. But just like a marriage, you have to continue to work at it. Um, so we, we have to continually invest in, in maintaining that those neutral brokers, if you like, acting in, in the ecosystem. And, and, I, and I hope that continues. You asked about the challenges. So, the, you know, there's a number of growing pains. Um, Bristol is a small city. Um, it's bursting at the seams. That's having the effect of house prices going up. So that's a challenge. Uh, but we've also got, it's becoming more acute, the inequality gap, if you like, and the, the barriers physical, soft, perceived of people in different geographies and different communities uh, of, of whatever descriptor, being able to access the prosperity that is seen on the other side of the fence, if you like. Um, and of course, the, the challenge is that we've got companies wanting to grow and needing talent, and you've got a lot of people who are potential, you know, occupants of those roles, but there's a gap in the middle. And some of that is is the fault of, or, or the, that we need to help companies find better ways of recruiting and be open to more, uh, to ways of recruiting more diverse talent. But our education system needs to adapt to support that, the, the pathways uh, into modern modern styles and sector of business and technologies and skill sets and so on. Uh, but we also need to do some work around um, making, removing some of the, 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 the perceived or actual barriers that prevent people thinking they can access those jobs or the training. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and a lot of work gets done at Engine Shed and has done for the last few years and, and by others to raise awareness of this is what these are what jobs look like and you kids from inner city Bristol from whatever background you are we need you and you don't need a degree to get into some of these jobs so so you know th there's, there's plenty of opportunity now it's easy to say that for some people it looks like there's, there isn't an opportunity and we need to break down some of the barriers. Um, uh, and um, so there's work to do, but I, but I think everything's solvable. There's, a, there's an element of like, we've seen flourishing um, boot camps for like developers, for example, yeah. like being trained. Obviously these boot camps have a cost and they're not accessible to everybody, but they do help solving one part of the issue of like, people that are not developers but, or, or, yeah. or technical engineers, but they want to like participate in that kind of jobs. But do you think what we'll see in the next two, three years, not much more bootcamp, but more maybe programs like you did with the, with the, uh, with the set squares, but more geared towards inclusivity yeah, itself? Yeah, so definitely I think there's, there's a lot of um, appetite uh, to do more. And I, so I think... The, the, I think there's a place for boot camps. I've had, I, in fact, I had a conversation this morning with somebody wanting to try and fill that gap to to get diverse talent into the jobs that are there um, with some form of boot camp, but that does specifically make accessible to people who perhaps can't access the other things. So whether that's about cost or whether that's about engagement or, you know, the fact is if you've got a a large demand for, for, for talent, um, there's, a, there's a commercial model that says that that training doesn't need to cost the learner. Um, uh, there should be guarantee of, of job and, and that's, we're starting to see that. Um, uh, so there's also that, that perception that obviously when you see a picture about the bootcamp going on or when you see like the promotion of the bootcamp, if the only thing you see are the so-called uh, middle-aged white men, yeah, 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 um, yeah. You, you're already creating that cleavage between, between yeah. the two. So we need to be better, like the perception of it, and making sure that everybody's included. Yeah, everybody. yeah. So, so, so um, we need role models. Uh, we need to make sure the narrative is uh, is helpful uh, in. Um, 
in demonstrating that that everyone is welcome. But there's work to do on the employer side and and, and on the supply side and the demand side, yeah. if you like, and and the bits in the middle. So there is there is lots to do, but there's there's plenty of potential to resolve that, and there's an awful lot of goodwill and some good initiatives coming through um, uh, that will help that. And the combined authority, and you know, I am working doing a bit of work for the combined authority Weka. Uh, putting quite a lot of money, making quite a lot of money available for innovative new ways of solving these kind of challenges. So I'm, I'm excited about the future. As, cool. much, as challenging as it's going to be, and I'm still going to play a part in, in that as best I can, uh, but I think there's plenty of opportunity here. So going back to the engine sheds, what kind of... I want to say what kind of crazy minds or what kind of crazy person does it take to create engine sheds? I mean, because if I remember well, that was nothing. Like it was a dump, that place before. And yeah. then you came up with that vision. You came up with this building is today the heart of the, um, the, the technical ecosystem of Bristol. What does it take to create something like that? Oh, is it? That's a really, really good question. It's difficult because um, y you would describe it as an entrepreneurial approach. There was a there was a need. I had to find a new home for the Set Squared Incubator. We, the Set Squared Incubator, was thriving on the university precinct. Uh, we were given six months' notice to leave the space at the university with no, you know, I was an employee of the university, no. Here's a new office for you. Just you need to find somewhere else to go. So I kind of had to. So you know they say that necessity is the mother of all invention. So I had the time, um, uh, a, a timeline that I had to find a new space. Uh, the council had this building, uh, which was a shell. They needed to put it into good use. We needed a home. It was clearly at the basic level an obvious fit. It was an opportunity for us to take the incubator from nice, leafy, middle-class Clifton to a much uh, more diverse uh, and uh, in some respects challenged part of the city um, and an opportunity to actually find better ways of doing what, what we did and find some ways of better making an impact on the city of the set squid incubator now that was as much as i thought through the vision uh i didn't have much more than that other than it felt right to have a bigger space where we could do we could experiment that was as much and there isn't in the business plan there isn't much more than that it's a lot of woolly words um uh and a spreadsheet with some numbers in which was a pure guess the council bought into that, the university bought into that, the Inwood Investment Service, who were kind of key partner because they needed a home as well, put some money in the pot. We had enough money just to do the refurbishment. We did business plan to opening in 11 months. So there wasn't any time to think through any vision. We got it open and we just operated it. And on the way during that time, so, oh yeah, we'll have meeting rooms, we'll hire them out, or we'll have this members lounge thing, or we'll, we'll create a model where we take the money we generate, surplus we generate, uh, and spend that on interesting projects. We were developing this on the fly. So it kind of was an entrepreneurial startup. And what is really fascinating is being able to do that, and I really don't, still don't understand quite how we did it, um, of doing that within the environment of the, of the city council and the university. But on the face of it, are the least entrepreneurial institutions in the city, but actually they're not. Um, uh, they can't be because we we, cre we created this, which 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 was quite vibrant. But it was part of that relationship between the two organisations that, that enabled this, and some key people within both organisations who who made it happen. The you know, on the university side, Guy Orpen, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, was key. Uh, on the council, Stephen Hilton, but also the mayor, George Ferguson, at the time. Uh, really bought into it. So it's about people, business is about people, and those people bought into it and we, and we made it happen. Um, uh, and it's only over the years that we evolved this model of, of, okay, actually our mission is sustainable, inclusive economic growth. 
It's kind of what we'd always been doing. It's what I've been trying to do with Set Squared all the way along. I just hadn't used that label. Um, uh, but it became obvious to me very early on that being inclusive about what you do is not a compromise. It's not a tick box. It's not there to get kudos. There's business benefit in having more people and more diverse people involved, whether it's at board level of a business, whether it's engaged in activities. And by no means are we doing as good a job, is Engine Shed doing as good a job? Certainly when I was running it until last year, there's no way that we were doing as good a job as we should by a long way. But it was about the narrative as much as anything that diversity in a team is a positive it's not a compromise. So never treat it as a tick box exercise. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're on hiding, hiding to nothing. So hopefully what we did during that time, as much as anything, was to change the narrative that there are different ways of doing things. And the beauty of what evolved from the, the partnership of the council and the university and having this space and having a bit of cash that we're generating, generating out of the building was that we kind of had the permission to experiment. I mean, the credibility of the council and the university, without any, you know, direct, I mean, there was kind of the, uh, an appropriate governance model, but no day-to-day -day, um, uh, kind of direction of, of, of what we're doing allowed us that freedom to operate um, and experiment and try things like teacher work experience, like the Refugee entrepreneur proje Entrepreneurship Project, like the investment activator uh, idea that, that was only just now it's come to fruition. Um, uh, and that, and that was great fun <laughs> for, for a start, <laughs> but, but you know, hopefully it demonstrated to others that it's okay to try things at risk. So, but, but, you know, that's, that we, that's what we encourage. That's what we teach through our entrepreneurship programs. Why not operate that at an economic development level? So I, I want to come back to the level of experiments in a second. But I think that, I, I guess, your very last experiment last year before uh, before you finished off was the Bristol Technology Festival, something that's we right. actually collaborated on. But yeah. you, I, I guess that's the, quint or, or I remember you presenting me that project. The aim was to get tech event to be open to non-tech people, basically. Um, how did it go? Well, so I mean, that was an interesting one. It, it, it became obvious to me seeing, and we did, you know, we started this conversation at the beginning of 2019. Uh, it became obvious to me there were some, a number of tech related events in the city, some big ones, some small. But whilst Bristol has all sorts of other festivals, like the Kite Festival, the Balloon Fiesta, the Harbour Festival, uh, Jazz Festival, etc. Uh, and a whole load of festivals in different serving different communities that I'm not couldn't remember to list. Um, but we didn't have a tech festival, and that seemed odd, given that we had such a such a, such a cluster. Whether festival was the right word, or or it, it should be Bristol Tech Week, or, or don't know. But anyway, so the idea is we should do something to try and raise the game to promote what's great about Bristol and the fact there's such vibrancy of what's going on, but not just as a uh, um, flag waving thing to the rest of the world or the rest of the, the country but to, to get Bristolians to understand what's on their doorstep be they the lay citizen be they the, the school kid or the pet excuse me the parent of, of, of school kids if we want to get more people thinking that they have a uh, they've got a role to play in the future of the city um, the tech community, the tech sector could be a place for them. Well, if they don't know about it, they're never gonna they're never gonna find it. So, so for me, what was critical with with the technology festival was to make sure there were events for techies, uh, for visitors to the city, kind of inward investors, um, uh, for the layperson and for young people. And we did this. You know, we we didn't have much. Um, resource. So this was about crowdsourcing the, the, the festival. So one approach would have been to say, right, we want an event for this, we want an event for this, who's going to do that? But that would have taken too much time and we probably would have designed it wrong. 
Whereas what we did is working with Cookies HQ, which is fantastic, create, create a website uh, and invite applications. And the criteria were very simple. Is it in Bristol? Is it tech related? Does it serve one of these audiences? And is it as inclusive as it possibly can be? And if so, it can go on the website and you know, no funding involved. The company, the, each event funds itself or has its own funding model. Um, uh, and we had something like, I can't remember now, 40, 40 different events over the week. It was um, a big week. Uh, which, which was fantastic, covering all different different angles. And, and thanks to everybody who, you know, some events were going to happen anyway, uh, but were, you know, benefited from the, from the, the overarching brand. Some events were put on, I think, Cookies HQ put on, on, on an event um, on user design, I think. Um, accessibility. Actually. Accessibility, that was it. Yeah. Accessibility. In, we threw in, right in, in well tech. with this inclusivity. Yeah, so that, that was really useful. But, but, you know, you hopefully you were encouraged to put that on because there was an excuse to put it on and there was a bit of extra profile. It was an experiment, you know. I think it worked. There was not everything worked perfectly, but um, uh, we proved that we could do it. So I want to go back very briefly around this idea of experiments and as we speak I mean outside of this podcast it seems that your life is just a series of experiments basically but somehow <laughs> somehow you managed to pull them off and they all seem to work out nicely have you had any failures have you had anything that you would say oh I would do that differently now like ah well those are two different questions aren't yes. they so there, there's some things which haven't worked and I'll I'll, I'll I'll think of um, uh, we we tried so many so many um, uh, things. Oh, so one thing that, that didn't work uh, was so we, the the two questions. One one is two different things. One is you can do something it doesn't it doesn't work. Would you have done it any differently? No, I don't think there's anything I would have would have done differently. There are some things that I didn't do. I didn't know how to do. Or I didn't have the right skill set to do, which is part of why I decided to step away and let somebody else take it on. But in terms of things that, that didn't go well, um, the two experiments we tried, one was I've always been interested in the uh, trying to break down this false barrier between not-for-profit and for-profit enterprises. So the social enterprise or charity versus the for-profit business they're frequently perceived as chalk and cheese. You know, a business can't talk about social value or impact and a, and a not-for-profit can't talk about business practice uh, or profit. Um, and, and both of those are, are, are rubbish. Businesses need to think about their social impact because that's the currency now, not least to recruit younger talent. Um and if, an, if a social enterprise or a charity doesn't think about effective business practice and governance and making a profit, then it's going to go out of business and it won't be able to create any impact. So, so there's learning to do. The language might be different. What happens to the profit will be different, but there's lots of learning. So we tried, um, we subsidised the rent uh, in one of the containers at the, at the back um, for three social enterprise organisations to come together to try and see if they could work together to, to be stronger together, but as part of this kind of more mainstream community. Um, and it, it didn't work out for various reasons, but it was worth a try. And, and those involved, the people involved, were very grateful for having had that, that opportunity. And then the other thing, we had a couple of um, Portuguese uh, people um, come to Bristol and say they were going to set up a games a games publishing incubator. So we gave them free rent in one of the rooms downstairs. That never went anywhere. Um, perhaps that was too much of a risk. I didn't do much due diligence on them or do much to help them. But my approach is, well, it, if you help somebody too much, I mean, this is our approach to incubation. If you provide too much support and too much prop, then, then you're not doing yeah. the company any any favour. It's just like parenting of, of teenage kids. You know, don't make life too easy for them, or they'll stay and not grow. Um, so that didn't work out. But hey, it was worth it was worth a try. So I guess your your what you just said around um, too much prob or too much hand holding in a company kind of like lead me into nicely into my last point, which is 
So now that you're out of the engine shed, you're you're a big advocate for companies having a board, having board members. And certainly this is, so we, we've got a friend in common who joined us as a board member and helped us forming a board like probably two years ago now. Okay. And, and I have to be honest, if you would have asked me two years ago, you need a board, or you would have tell me you need a board or something like that, probably I love, and for yeah. me a board was for like big companies. Right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and in yeah. fact, the first time we put board member meeting in the calendar, it felt wrong basically <laughs> it felt the fraud yeah, um, yeah and actually now i could go back without not having it because it's it's an extremely valuable tool whether you have an external party or not just this time there's a mix of reflection and accountability um it, it's a fantastic tool and yeah. actually when now we talk to other businesses like this is sure what yeah, yeah, yeah that's good that's so good. can we can we talk about that can we talk about this and and obviously you i guess i have my view on the smaller scale kind of companies, you have a view on like slightly larger scale of company. What kind of tips can you give to people that are looking to create a board? And the people that can afford a board, they will be able to afford people to run them. Uh, but the ones that can't afford them, how, where do you start and how can you make buy with the people that you know? So, um, lots of lots of bits in there. So. The, 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 I guess the first one is the, is the why. What's the point of having a, a board? What's the point of, of, of building a board uh, that is more than just the founding CEO and perhaps the technical director or the finance director? What's the point of building a board with somebody non-exec, somebody who isn't full-time in the business? Well, it's as much about sharing the load, about getting that sanity check that you're on the right track, it's also about, you know, you, you you get this response from people when you say you're gonna you should you should have a board of of um, well I know how to run my business well that's fine I'm sure you do, but do you know the things you don't know? Well, of course you don't. So how do you make sure that you're you're fulfilling the potential of both yourself and your business on the on your own? You may be perfect. Some people are perfect or not. <laughs> um, so having somebody else on board who is, as a director, as a legal responsible to act 24-7 in the interest of the company, even if you're only paying them for a day a month, they're, they're on your back, they're on your side or covering your back all the time. Well, they should be. You know, you, you can hire the wrong person in any team and the board is, is no different from any team. So finding the person... Um, to fulfill the role that you need. And for different companies, it's going to be different. But somebody who can provide that objective challenge to help fill the gaps. And it's about, you know, um, filling the gap. Nobody, frankly, nobody is perfect. So everybody has their weaknesses. So how can you fill those bits of weakness on, on, on your board to make sure that you are fulfilling your potential. Now, you have a legal responsibility as a director of a company to act in the interests of your own business. Even if you're the owner of it, you actually have a responsibility to think about the future of the company that is different from your own ownership of it. Subtle, but, 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 but true. So, and then the other thing, of course, is that if your aspiration for the business is to be static forever, well, fine, continue with what you've got. If you want to scale, how do you make sure, just like you're building a house, you make sure you've got the, 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 the foundations. You don't overdo it, but you're probably going to err on the side of putting in stronger foundations than your calculations might suggest. Just to give you that, that safety, and perhaps you can put an extra floor on the building if you've got enough money. Well, it's the same with building a board. Build in structure. This is exactly what we did, and this is based on my own learning. When we founded a company, we hired a non-exec chair at day one. It was the best thing we ever did. So when we listed three years later, we hadn't planned to list on the stock exchange, but when we listed, it went through as smoothly as it possibly could have done because we'd had a non-exec chair who was building in the right level, not onerous, but the right level of structure and discipline and strategic thinking so that... The listing on stock exchange was a, was a breeze, and we went to the full full list and raised uh, seventeen million quid uh, in two thousand. Um, so, so building in that that capability is to me it's an absolute no brainer. Yes, 
there's a there's a cost involved and you need to make sure you get the right person it's not just going and find you know will uncle bob or aunt jane yeah. do me a favor and sit on my board no that's not good enough but, that, but, that's 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 a waste of time and actually probably dangerous you need to think right okay what do i need to achieve what do i need in my team if you're a competent CEO, this is how you should be looking at building teams within your business. So apply that thinking to your, your own board. And it's not a failure to, to have somebody else working at your level giving you challenge. You know, if it works for big companies, why can't it work for small companies? But I think, I think that's, the, that's, the, that's probably the big um, discussion that happens around the board is like when you when you hear about a board you usually hear about that from like companies floating on the board on the, uh, yeah. on the stock exchange or you hear about that from like 100 plus people kind of company yeah, yes yeah, they yeah, have yeah. a board and everything um it's really rare to hear a small company like 10 15 people to yeah. talk about the board or to talk about having a board meeting and yeah. um we've actually decided to make some of our key some of our key people from the team to be part of the board yep because yep. we felt that it would the right sure. thing to do, yep. especially that for us, it was like, it was an element of like having external parties helping us on the growth, yep. but yep. also because yep. we're husband and wife, having a person on the board to act as a um, person. A neutral from, voice. Yeah, a neutral yeah, yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that was yeah. actually, that was actually yeah. super useful. Yeah. But yeah. That, that element of like, and, and I guess is, is the, my, my, sorry, where I was going, the question was, does the IOD has that in mind when they talk about boards, do they try to target the smaller companies? Because I think there's a huge benefit that could be done here that I, I, smaller companies do not realize that they need. Yeah, the so, so, yeah, so, so um, no, the IOD is not doing enough to help smaller businesses understand the, the, the value of, of, of building a board. The IOD's mission is about creating better directors to make better businesses, to make a better UK PLC. Uh, there's more to do. Um, the work I've been doing at the Combined Authority at Weka is starting to look at that, is how can we uh, create better understanding of the value of a board to help drive productivity, to help reduce climate impact, and to increase inclusion, all of which align, and, and none of which is a compromise. Um, but those are kind of board level decisions. And, and to be able to make strategic decisions around those issues, you need capability around the, around the board table. I mean, the other way to look at this, of course, is that any business, whether it's destined to be a thousand person company or 50 person company or static at 10 people, whatever, you have to plan for exit points, right? So whether it's it's the, the founder of the company wanting to retire or falling ill or whatever, succession planning needs to be a part of that. And you actually have a responsibility for succession planning. Well, part of the succession planning, if you can have continuity with a non-exec, helps founder extricate themselves and get more value out of the business whether that's planned or, or unplanned. If you're going to take investment, having somebody to share the load, add credibility, but also um, temper the dynamic. You talked about husband and wife on the board. Founding CEO and venture capitalist investor is often not as dissimilar <laughs> dynamic sometimes that, that can be rosy or it can be slightly fraught. Having a, a, a neutral voice in those kind of dynamics becomes really important. And especially if you have multiple investors, having a neutral chair yeah. especially can be the thing which, which makes or breaks a, a, a company. So whatever the trajectory of a company, there is value in having a board. For some, the value may be less than, 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 than not. But I don't think it's acceptable for a company to set on a path with... And running the risk of founding CEO getting run over by a bus and the company fails. You have a responsibility to protect against that, actually. You know, there's also the value of the company for your estate. If, that, if you're the CEO who's been run over by a bus, your family, you know, need the value of the, of, of the company. Having a board more than just you protects you against that. So in every scenario, there's value in having a, a board. As you can tell, it's my... 
my <laughs> pet pet topic. Pet topic. So does that mean we're going to hear more? We're going to hear more you talking about that for yes. like yeah. talks and you you've yes. given a few talks about that. Yes, so. yeah, and and I think it's critical. I think it, I think um, uh, it, it it's it's one of the, one of an, a small number of things I'm going to be focusing on going forward is that board level capability and decision making and partly you know I'll do that through doing non-exec directorships but also championing it training in it helping set policy in that but of course the the big point for me is this is as much a route to better inclusion in the city because it has to be these have to be board level decisions and which of course includes diversifying boards so I've got some ideas around how yeah. we can how we can do that and diversification isn't just about gender or ethnicity. It's also about age, and also about generally, it's about different perspectives that make better better businesses. So, talking about age, Nick Sturge, nine years old. What did you want him to be? When I was nine, <laughs> uh, I may have been in the Bob the Builder stage, and not Bob the Builder the program because that hadn't been invented yet. But I wanted <laughs> to be a builder called Bob. Um, okay. Uh, I think I was probably at that stage. Um, soon after that, I wanted to be an ambulance driver. Okay. Um, uh, and then after that, I wanted to... I was always interested in medicine um, and the medical side of things. I didn't want to be a doctor, uh, so I thought I wanted to do medical electronics, which is was my first kind of which career. Which is how you joined the electronics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're not allowed to enter the engine sheds. Your favourite place of all in Bristol? Could be a park, could be a restaurant, could be a street, your favourite, favourite place? It's Queen Square. Queen Square. Any yeah. parts I, of I, I, I've, I, seen, I've seen the, the old pictures of Queen Square, which yeah. I didn't know was actually a drive Well, part, part of it, part of it is, is that it's such a, a nicer place than it was when I was a kid, when it did have a dual carriageway through it. Uh, but it's such a beautiful place and uh, you've got, it's a thoroughfare, so people are always moving about. But in the summer, when you get people of all different shapes and sizes and, and colours and ages, you know, you see silent discos, you see volleyball, you see people strumming guitars. You know, I'm sure people having a few spliffs here and there and a few tinnies. Um, brilliant. I mean, it's just it's just beautiful with the with the heritage of the um, uh, of the old buildings around. Uh, and it's where the city someone made the decision to reinvest in recreating the how it looked originally uh and i think that was inspired cool people want to find more about you where what's the best place is it linkedin twitter? linkedin is linkedin, is, 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 LinkedIn or twitter yeah but um look for me nick sturge on twitter uh and uh nick sturge on linkedin cool thank you very much pleasure nice Cheers. to meet you This podcast was brought to you by Cookies HQ, a Bristol-based software agency who builds apps and websites for early stage founders and growing startups. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can drop us a message at The Cookies HQ on Twitter or head to www.cookieshq.co.uk forward slash podcast for more episodes.